Good evening. The, the time is now 7 o'clock, and I would like to call the Boyd City Council meeting to order at this time. First order of business is uh, roll call. All counselors are present. Second order of a Pledge of Allegiance. May we all stand, please? Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 3, please. Item 3A is a presentation of the United States Fire Administration Executive Fire Officer Graduation Certificate and designation to Deputy Fire Chief Joe Murray. Chief Liggett. Good evening. If I could please have uh, Chief Murray and Assistant Chief Retired Tim Curtis join me here at the podium. This evening, um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the U.S. Fire Administration National Fire Academy announced on December 5, 2016 that Joseph M. Murray, Jr. successfully completed the Executive Fire Officer Program. The Intensive Fire Officer Program is designated to provide senior fire officers with a broad perspective on various facets of fire administration. According to the U.S. Fire Administrator Ernie Mitchell, Jr., this program provides fire officers with the expertise they need to succeed in today's challenging environment. Each of the four courses required a written applied research project to demonstrate application of course theory and concepts to real life situations within the student's organization. Each of these projects was evaluated through a formal process and progression through the program was contingent on achieving each of these milestones. Mitchell also stated it is important that these senior fire executives apply what they have learned to the classroom, to the, in the classroom to the existing situations in their communities. This makes the completion of the executive fire officer program, <clears throat> this makes completion of the executive fire officer program and the applied research projects particularly valuable to these fire service leaders. <laughs> Six months after completion of each of the courses, the EFOP participants are required to complete an applied research project in their organization. The required executive level courses are executive development. The entry level course emphasizes team development, consensus, consensus decision making to enhance organizational effectiveness. The next course in the sequence is executive analysis of community risk reduction. This is a mixture of philosophy and application. The value of, of the community risk reduction and the process of applying risk reduction to the community. It involves developing partnerships with the community to implement programs, initiatives, and services that prevent and or mitigate the risk of human made or natural disasters. Traditional fire prevention programs are addressed. For the third year, participants com complete the Executive Analysis of Fire Service Operations in Emergency Management course. This course is, for, is very critical curriculum in today's incident response environment. The administration of incident response in the light of Federal Response Plan, the Integrated Emergency Management System, Emergency Operations Center functions, planning, documentation are all of the topics covered. The final course, Executive Leadership, examines all aspects of executive level, level leadership and ties together the educational experience of the previous three years. The National Fire Administration offers a wide array of programs and courses for fire service and allied professions. Courses are delivered on campus as well as throughout the nation in coordination with state, local, and fire training officials. That's a brief history about the program and the exceptional work that Deputy Chief Murray had to complete as he worked through this coursework. Um, in a moment, I'm going to have him describe a few of his projects. But first, what I'd like to do is uh, invite a previous EFO graduate and my retired Assistant Chief Tim Curtis to help me present the plot. Thanks, everyone. I'm very, very honored to be here tonight to present Chief Murray with this award. Um, just getting into program is difficult. It's very competitive. 
once you're in a program, it's a lot of dedication. Two months away from home at the fire academy going through lectures which build leadership skills <coughs> and going through exercises that enhance your command skills and give you more confidence. I'm very, very proud of Joe for, for uh, completing this program. Joe, congratulations. Thanks, Chief. Joe, this is your graduation certificate uh, from the National Fire Academy for your executive fire officer. Uh, and uh, on the back is the letter I received from the acting superintendent of the Fire Academy re regarding the presentation of this plaque. I'd like you to keep that for pos posterity. And uh, I am very, very proud of you, and I appreciate your contribution to the leadership and uh, effectiveness of the Blade Fire Department. And I look forward to your long and uh, prosperous and contributory career. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to thank the, the city for, part, for letting me go and, and do this class and do this whole program. Um, it was uh, a great experience, made a lot of uh, new friends uh, that just besides the amount of uh, education that I received. Um, I want to thank um, my uh, co-workers at the fire department for participating in all the uh, surveys and the interviews and everything. Um, those guys have been a great support network too for me. And then obviously my uh, family and friends, um, and especially my wife and uh, kids, who supported me through the whole whole time. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Item four is public hearings. Item 4A, please. Item 4A is a resolution authorizing a conditional use permit to allow an exhaust stack extension of 101 feet for the property located at 3150 Kettle Way. Ms. Christensen. Before I begin my presentation, I'll begin by saying happy birthday <laughs> to our council president, Kevin Levy. <laughs> See, I couldn't, I couldn't jump over there to get you like I were on the rest of them, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Tori Harding, SL Snacks, Wisconsin LLC, has applied for this conditional use to extend the exhaust stack from 76 feet to 100 feet in order to meet DNR air quality requirements. Um, the maximum height for a building in the M2 manufacturing district is 75 feet. However, the maximum height may be exceeded through a conditional use permit. Um, they would like to also like to install on-site fencing in two areas to satisfy DNR requirements to restrict public access from any areas where a 24-hour threshold of particulate matter could be exceeded given the right production and weather conditions. There is a map on the location and zoning map. Um, you will see those two areas are identified. Um, there's a proposed four-foot fence at 3125 Kettle Way and then a um, four-foot fence on the other side as well um, in the staff report is a description of exactly how it is but it's what's on that drawing um, plan commission did review this item on july 19th um, and held a public hearing and voted unanimously to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the four conditions which are in your resolution which is in your packet tonight um, which is that fences may be constructed on private property um, and shall not be located on the right of way the fence line shall include perennial plantings the applicant shall coordinate with the FAA regarding the height of the exhaust stack and its proximity to the airport. The applicant shall obtain a building permit prior to the beginning prior to beginning construction of the project. And then your standard about major changes coming back through this public process and minor changes can be approved administratively. Um, and this also did go to the Gateway Review Board, um, who also recommended approval. Okay, thank you. I, <clears throat> item 4A is on the agenda this evening for uh, public hearing at this time. I would like to open up the public hearing on item 4A. If there's anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening, please come forward and state your name and address for the record. First call, is there anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? Second call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? Third and final call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4A this evening? Seeing none, I would close the port, uh, public hearing at this time and for discussion purposes, entertain a motion for approval from council. Is there a motion? Motion by pressure. Is there a second? Second, second by Duncan. Any councilor comments? Uh, councilor DeForest. 
Thank you. I had asked in plan commission, um, Julie, do you know if they found out if there's any FFA concerns about the height? Have we heard about it? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Any other council questions or comments? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second. All in for favor of approval, say aye. 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 Any opposed, hearing none, item 4A passes. Item 4B, please. 4B is a resolution authorizing a conditional use permit to allow a bar restaurant with an outdoor seating area and indoor and outdoor sales possession and consumption of alcohol for the pur proposed microbrewery that will be located at 1895 Gateway Boulevard. Ms. Christensen. Lee Gunderson, G5 Brewing Company, um, has applied for this conditional use to allow everything that Laurie laid out. I won't try to repeat it. Uh, if approved, food and alcohol would be served in the restaurant portion of the building and outdoor patio which are allowed as conditional use in the M1 district. Um, they did submit um, liquor license application on July 1st, and I believe it's on your agenda for referral to Alcohol Beverage License Control Committee tonight. Um, Planning Commission did review this item on July 19th, 2017, um, and they did vote unanimously to recommend approval of the conditional use, um, subject to the five conditions included in the resolution. The one change they made from the original staff recommendation um, was to require fencing if um, if issues came up with regard to control of alcohol. Um, so what is before you tonight are the following five conditions. That this conditional use permit authorizes the G5 Brewing Company to serve food and beverages in the restaurant and within the concrete patio area on the west side of the building. If problems arise related to the control of alcohol in the outdoor seating area, which could be remedied by fencing in the opinion of city staff, the applicant will be ordered to enclose the outdoor seating area with a four-foot wrought iron or similar fence in order to separate the outdoor seating area from pedestrian traffic. Um, prior to serving alcoholic beverages, the applicant shall obtain their alcohol beverage license, which must include the outdoor seating area. The applicant shall obtain a building permit prior to beginning construction of this project, and then your standard major conditions coming back through this public process and minor changes being approved administratively. Um, and we are very excited to see this proposed microbrewery coming to Beloit. Staff is even. So just to put my two cents in for that. And included in the packet is a site layout um, okay. of what they are proposing on this site, as well as renderings which show what it's going to look like. Okay. Thank you. This is on, on the agenda for a public hearing. At this time, I would like to open up the public hearing on item 4B. Is there anyone wishing to speak on item 4B? Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Second call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4B this evening? Third and final call, anyone wishing to speak on item 4B this evening? Seeing none, I would close the public hearing on item 4B and entertain a motion from council. So motion by DeForest. Second. Second by Duncan. Any council comments, questions? Seeing none, all in favor of approval say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Item 4B passes 7-0. <laughs> Item 5, public comments. We have reached a portion of the agenda where people, citizens may come down and, and speak. Uh, we do ask you to refrain from personal attacks on council member, staff, and anyone else. Uh, we do limit you to three minutes. I will not cut you off, but I'll give you a friendly reminder that you're approaching that three-minute mark. However, I must uh, state also, if you do come down and do personal attacks, we will end the discussion immediately. Is there anyone wishing to speak under public comments this evening? Seeing none, I will close that portion of the agenda and move to item 6C, which is the consent agenda. All items under the consent agenda are considered routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so request in which the event, the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered at this point on the agenda. Is there any councilor like anything removed from the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. Councilor DeForce. I'd like to request item 6E be removed, please. 6E will be removed from the consent agenda. Is there any other council would like any other item removed from the consent agenda? Seeing none, the consent agenda will consist of items 6A, B, C, D, F, G, and H. Uh, is there a motion for approval of that portion of the consent agenda? Second. Moved by Blakely, second by Presshaw. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that portion passes. Item 6E, please. 6E is a resolution rejecting all bids for Public Works Contract C-17-29 Mill Street Parking Lot Storm and Sanitary Sewer. Thank you, Mr. Frisbee, please. Good evening. Um, this spring, as part of the planning for the redevelopment of 310 State Street, the owners contacted us with some questions regarding their sanitary sewer, and it was found we didn't know where their sanitary sewer lateral went. Um, and we also found two others that we didn't know where they went. So while looking for them, 
it was determined their sanitary sewer lateral was actually disconnected in 2001. And so this project is to restore their connection to the sanitary sewer. Their initial sewer went out back, and so that's where we look to replace the sewer, even though State Street might have been a good option, but we wanted to avoid the brick street. Um, so when we went through, designed it out back, bid out the construction, two bids were received with the low bid of being $85,000, which was considerably more than our estimate. Uh, so then we, we went back and decided to analyze going out front onto State Street and found we could do the work for approximately $15,000. So we thought it'd be prudent to reject the bids for this project save $70,000 and make the connection out front. Now we still have one lateral, we're not sure where it goes, but before we actually dig into State Street with this project, we will find out where that is. We'll do more die testing. And if we find that it goes out back and we need to do 310 out back also, we can do that under our maintenance contract for less money than these bids were. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, if I could, just to get it on the floor for discussion, mm -hmm. entertain a motion. So moved. So, motion by DeForest, second by Presho. Councilor Commons, Councilor DeForest. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for looking for a way to do this more efficiently. I understand the concern about disturbing the bricks, um, but this certainly will save a lot of money, so I appreciate that. I do want to make sure, um, because this is something that we missed, are there any other laterals that are unaccounted for anywhere in that block or along that section of State Street? There's just the one just for... The three? There, there were three originally. We found where two of them went. One does go out front to State Street already, and one came to this disconnected line, and the third one we're still unsure where it goes. We think it connects through another building. Okay. But we'll do more die testing to verify. And you'll be able to determine that? We hope so. Okay. <laughs> We've die tested it twice and haven't found where the die came out yet. Okay. So we'll resolve that before we start digging yes. to make sure that we have a complete picture and move forward. Yep. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Councilor Pressure. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure that when we go to go ahead with this project that we only dig it up once and not repeatedly as we find more problems. Right. So I want to make sure that that uh, that we're we're moving ahead with the right project in the end. And uh, hopefully we don't have to dig up State Street. And if we have to dig up the uh, back end, then we have to dig up the back end. But that we get it fixed, you know, we find the fix that works for once and for all. Right. The mistake made yep. 17 years ago it needs to be corrected. So, okay. Yep. So we're going to make sure that happens. Yes, we will. Okay, thanks, Bill. And thanks. I do want to note that the bricks will be replaced by the contractor who originally installed them. So it should be a very good installation. And we should barely be able to tell that it was disturbed when it's done. Okay. Councilor DeForest. Could you let the public know? Sorry, could you let the public know what the estimated cost of that brick repair will be? Uh, the brick repair, we got a quote of sixty-eight hundred dollars from the contractor, but they gave me an area that was probably close to twice the size we're actually going to disturb. So the cost for the repair will actually probably be in the four to five thousand dollar range. Okay, great, thank you. Council pressure. Yeah, and then. Um, and then I was wondering, as far as the disturbance to the area, because there, there's Discover uh, several Wisconsin crews in town shooting and stuff this summer, and we we don't want orange cones sitting all over our, our sidewalks and our streets when they're out here shooting. So the disturbance will only be for less than a week's time? Right. It should be three to four days. Um, we've talked to the contractor about possibly doing it on a weekend after farmer's market started, do it Saturday afternoon, Sunday, Monday. Um, they gave us considerably more costs, so we're, we're going to evaluate that compared to doing it on Monday through Thursday. Okay. So it's, the disturbance will be as minimized as you can make it? Yes. Thank you. Three, hopefully, no more than four days. Okay. Councilor Blakely, did you have anything? Um, my question, too, was just about the timeline, the timetable. It sounds like you have a very efficient plan in place. Yes. We, can, we could go as soon as next week as long as we verify the lateral for Chic and Unique. Any other councilor questions or comments? Seeing none, there is a motion and a second for approval to reject the bids. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Item seven, ordinances, please. 
7A is a proposed ordinance to amend certain sections of the Index of Special Locations, Section 13.02 of the Code of General Ordinances of the City of Beloit, relating to the removal of traffic signals and the establishment of stop signs at the intersection of Bluff Street and West Grand Avenue in the City of Beloit. This is first reading. Mr. Norwood. Good evening, everyone. Earlier this spring, the traffic signal controller equipment at the intersection of Bluff Street and West Grand Avenue stopped working. This particular intersection is located immediately west of downtown. Beginning March 6th, the city's engineering staff conducted a study to determine if the traffic light was still necessary at this intersection. Using federal guidelines, the study was conducted and it was determined that this intersection did not meet any of the nine criteria for maintaining a traffic signal. Simply put, there is not enough vehicle or pedestrian traffic going through the intersection to warrant a traffic signal at this location. Besides not meeting any of the criteria, repairs for the unneeded traffic signal would run between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. In addition, excuse me, in addition, uh, numerous neighbors living in the near the intersection expressed a desire to have the traffic signals removed. At this time, it's a recommendation of the city's engineers and the city's traffic review committee that these signals be removed and replaced with stop signs for all four directions. Okay. Um, thank you. What I want to do before we move it to the vote here, I just have a couple questions. I would, I would ask the questions now because uh, I, I have a plan that I want to do. See the smiling so she knows exactly where I'm going with this. How were the residents, first of all, were are we certain that enough residents were contacted to make sure that they don't have a problem with this um, sure. around in this area? Uh, the engineers had put out public notice and were soliciting commentary. Uh, from my understanding, there was no more than four, maybe five emails that were actually sent back to the Public Works Department in regards to this. Also, my understanding, there was some comments to individual council members as far as what uh, their personal thoughts were on the matter. and. Frankly, I, I, the response was underwhelming in regard to that for the most part. So Okay, so then the second part of the question is how would we get the word out um, versus people start driving down the street and don't see the stoplight <laughs> there anymore? Um, could cause a little confusion there. Um, do we have a plan to get the word out to the public to let them know that this is coming? Or Oh, absolutely. We, we intend once this is approved to put out a press release to let them know that this is a permanent change to that intersection. Okay. In addition, uh, is, as is standard procedure, once the lights are removed, uh, the traffic stop signs are going to have red flags on top of them all four directions so that hopefully folks will notice that and uh, act accordingly. Okay. So I guess how soon after the press release are, are there stop signs Put in or stop lights taken out. How we will make sure that the, we'll make sure that the counts the traffic signals themselves are not removed as far as the flashing until we've had at least a week to a week and a half out to make sure that everybody has been made aware. And we'll reach out to the press as well to make sure that we get the word out <coughs> as best we can. Okay, Councilor DeForest. Thank you. I would like to emphasize this is why um, ordinance changes have two readings so that the public has the opportunity to find out about it, talk about it, and get back to us. So I would really encourage this body not to waive the first reading. That's the whole point of having it. Um, and there's no need to expedite this. So I'm glad that we'll have some time to hear back from residents. And could you clarify for us the, the responses you did receive? Um, I'm assuming we're in the affirmative. They wanted the traffic signal removed. We, we, of the few that we had most were in favor of but there was an expression on a couple of people's behalf that they were concerned what you know the impact would be for that could you share what what were their concerns about the impact just the preference that they would like to have the light remain there as opposed to taking it to a four-way stop there was some concern apparently about the actual intersection and whether people are going to obey that you know mm -hmm. once it becomes a four lane four-way stop okay. okay city manager first I just wanted to point out that this issue was actually um, initially raised and brought to the attention of city staff during our listening sessions in the community. So it was the residents themselves within the neighborhood that indicated um, that they recognized that the signals were on a constant flash and that they didn't believe that the traffic unnecessarily warranted having new signals in place. And they suggested that we take a look 
um, at having traffic signs instead, which then went to the Traffic Review Committee. Uh, so I think this has been very responsive to the citizens, and clearly we need to make sure that we continue to communicate with them when the change takes place. Uh, but this is uh, one of the perhaps unintended results of some of our community listening sessions and just learning what issues are important to different neighborhoods throughout the city and making sure that we're being responsive to those concerns. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Presho. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make sure that everybody understands that there was a long process involved in, in, in removing stop si stoplights. Uh, it's, it's quite a quite a process. It was, I believe, a 90-day uh, review signed and uh, noted up at the intersection. Minimal, yes. And um, they were run stop uh, flashing red, so it was a four-way stop effectively. And it ran that for 90 days, and then it went into another period. I can't remember what the second period was. Um, was that the period where you decided? I'm not sure what the terminology is here yeah. in Wisconsin, but it's still flashing. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's going to continue until the stop signs come in. Absolutely. Um, and, and so there's there's been a, a, a long period of many months of, uh, of actual use, and I and all the feedback I got was, gee, isn't it nice? So I mean, I could sum it up with those three words. Um, so I, I had I had just one person worried again about traffic ignoring the lack of flashing lights and I had somebody say well, are they going to make those stop signs have flashing lights on them and I that was my going to be my question to you if there was any necess necessity for that you said the flags will be there yes and I know LEDs are cheap nowadays and you can run them off of solar power for like forever you know so I don't know if that's part of the plan or not so that would be at my this question. point it isn't but I can certainly consult back to the engineers my experience with flashing lights is that the constantly on lights are not effective in deterring uh, traffic over time and that um, while those are used on an occasional basis oftentimes they're activated only when pedestrians are present or crossing um, but those I, I believe and I would defer to our traffic engineers but yeah. uh, in prior debates uh, unfortunately because our traffic patterns are most of the individuals are living in neighborhoods um, you may not get the uh, adherence that you might like uh, we tend to stop seeing some of the things that we're accustomed to, but certainly we'll do everything within reason to make this a smooth transition. Thank you, Councilor DeForest. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And I know at the neighborhood listening session that I was at where they raised this as an issue, um, the residents that were in the proximity of that intersection did not like having the flashing lights constantly you know, in their in their residence. So I think that would actually not make them happy if we went to just a flashing stop sign versus a flashing stop light. So I would hope that we actually don't go that route. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Blakely, I apologize. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, birthday President. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that uh, as a member of the Traffic Review Committee, I was present for some of the discussions, and I know, um, as Mark was mentioning, how thorough all of this has been. I was among the counselors who was contacted by residents on the west side, um, and there was just one of the five people who contacted me Actually, there were two who expressed some concerns. One of them said, have we considered the LED solar-powered stop signs? So I just wanted you to know that some people have that on their minds. Um, one other person who had thought um, he preferred the stop lights for reasons of safety, um, once I, I spoke to him about the warrants, about that intersection not meeting any of the state warrants, you know, for for higher traffic or accidents or any of the other guidelines. He understood. And also when he heard about the large amount of money that the city will save by putting in stop signs instead, then he, he came on board. He was all for it. And none of these people were among those who had turned in comments to the city. So there are a few additional remarks from residents for you. Thank you. Any other counselor comments, questions, or concerns? Seeing none, um, Let's make a motion to lay over. There's a motion by Presho to lay it over there. Second? Second. Second by Blakely. Um, all those in favor of laying this over, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll lay it over to the next meeting. Uh, item 8, please. There are no appointments this evening. There are no appointments this evening. I, item nine, counselor activities and upcoming events. Uh, counselor Anderson. Thank you. Uh, it's been a while since we had a council meeting, so uh, I've been busy and I'm assuming the rest of you have too. 
Uh, one was we did a courageous conversation at Community Action. Sheila was present too, and it was about inclusion and diversity in the city of Beloit. Yeah, I wish that discussion would have continued on. I think we just scratched the surface on that talk. It was, you know, uh, beginning to really dive into some big issues. So I hope we do something like that again. Uh, next was I went to a Snappers game. You know, let's let's promote the local team. You know, not many cities have a baseball team at that level, so we should you know tr we should really cherish that. So if any of you have a chance to win by a game, it's uh, really a good value. It was really inexpensive when I went, and I was pretty surprised with that, you know, based on most of the pro teams that we have, and we see it's incredibly pricey. So it was a good uh, low value. Uh, something else I did was I attended the Rock County Homeless Count. Uh, it began at midnight and went on until 4 a.m. Uh, I found out that that's how we get funding to uh, combat homelessness, so doing that count is incredibly crucial. So... Uh, while we didn't find anybody, it was good to kind of go around and, you know, take a look and see if we could find anybody. Uh, I guess with the flooding, too, a lot of people have been moving around. So uh, we have incredibly uh, transient population in Rock County. So hopefully somebody else did find some of those families that we have. Uh, yeah, I think that's – oh, actually, last thing, National Night Out. I almost left that out. Uh, probably the biggest thing that we all probably did. Uh, yeah, National Night Out was, you know, such a great thing, you know, uh, having all these people host uh, block parties, so thank you to anyone who hosted those. Uh, I went to a few of them, and I wish I could have went to a few extra, but you know how it is. You bump into somebody, and you end up talking 20, 25 minutes, and you, know, you don't get to go to the next one. But uh, as upcoming events, I really don't have much anything going on, so uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Blakely. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Birthday President. <laughs> I, I, too, had a chance to go to the National Night Out. It was very gratifying. I went down to the riverfront and saw um, representatives from our police force and fire department. People from the Army were there. People from um, the sexual trafficking awarenesses groups were there. It was very worthwhile. And although there weren't as many uh, citizens present as I understand there were when we were the main location for Rock County, there was still a nice group of people down there, families with kids, individuals. So I was happy to be part of it. And then I went out to um, the neighborhoods and um, good food and fine conversation kept me lingering too. So there was that. Um, I stopped by the main fire department to have a cup of coffee as uh, Fireman Paul Taylor invited me to. Well, it happened to be a Monday morning and wouldn't you know it, as I pulled in, a fire truck pulled out. <laughs> There were fire, um, firefighters everywhere washing windows, cleaning the department, and no one had made coffee. <laughs> this is now an official complaint. <laughs> but I was invited back on some Friday morning, which would be a better day <laughs> to sit and relax. And I learned while I was there from Captain Dave Ferger that the fire department is having open houses uh, three late afternoons this week. The first one is tomorrow from 4 to 7 at the main fire station at 1111 Church Street. The next one is the same time, 4 to 7 on Wednesday, and um, the chief confirmed that's at Station 2, 2111 Cranston Road. The third open house takes place Thursday at the fire station at 1048 McKinley. There will be some good food there, some um, games or handouts for kids. So it's a good chance to stop by and see our local fire departments. Thank you. Councilor DeForest. Thank you. Well, thank you for making the announcement about the open houses. I, I hope that the community will get out and support those and get to talk with our firefighters. And uh, definitely ask questions about um, how, how our runs are right now. <laughs> uh, I'd like to follow up on um, my colleague, uh, Councillor Anderson's comments about the, the racial divide panel discussion that we participated in. Um, I feel pretty strongly that the discussion was great and there was a part of that discussion, some very concrete ideas, strategies uh, that we discussed. And I hope that uh, there will be some implementation of those and it won't just end with that discussion that we had that night. I was pretty excited about the energy in the room. Uh, it was standing room only. All the seats were full. People really care about this issue and want to see um, 
the city do more about the um, recruitment retention um, of uh, people of color um, of more diversity amongst our staff and um, I am appreciative of our, our um, city managers commitment to that and so I'm looking forward to seeing more work in that effort and not just discussion I uh, Able, was able to attend a school board meeting, which um, I think is a wonderful thing whenever we can attend other uh, bodies, intergovernmental bodies, um, to attend their meetings to make sure they know who we are. And I know whenever we've had school board members or county board members or town of Beloit or Janesville city councilors come to our meetings, it's very helpful because then we get to kind of see them and know them and have more frank discussion about how we can collaborate better. So would encourage that continued collaboration. Um, I certainly appreciate a national night out. It's always a fun event. Um, and thank you to all of our, um, our emergency response personnel for stepping up to help make that night special for our community. And I was able to check out the U.S. Cube Open. Uh, that's pretty cool that Beloit is the home to the U.S. Cube Open. And some of you might not know what Cube is, but Cube? Cube. 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 I was told it's cube like tube. That's what I, I was know, told. The guy running the show told me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what the guy from Switzerland told me. But maybe he was talking with his Switzerland accent. Don't have me, don't, don't have me, don't, don't have me use it. Okay, don't don't have me use it. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty a neat event we had. Um, I was talking with Celestino when I was there, and I think he said we had 15 states represented, and we did have some international competitors as well. So pretty impressive for Beloit to host. That. I guess we're, I guess maybe Kevin's going to have to check it out. <laughs> I'm all over it. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, but really, really neat. And of course, uh, Riverside Park is beautiful and such a great way to introduce people to the Blake community. Um, a couple things that I want to make sure that I announce. Um, first, just want to make a final announcement about my going away party on August 17th from 5 to 7 at the Rotary River Center. Um, goodbyes are very important to me, so I hope I get to see as many of you possible so I can say goodbye. And well, goodbye, but not forever. I'll be back after I get the travel bug out of me. Um, and who knows, come back in 10, 15 years. Uh, <laughs> you're laughing. Is it going to be more, you think? Uh, I don't know. Five? Yes. I don't know. Five, 20? I'm who knows? I'm getting on five. <laughs> um, so two other events that I wanted to make sure I announced. Uh, August 20th is the Peace in the Streets rally that Switch Lanes is organizing. Uh, it's going to be at Riverside Park on August 20th, so please mark your calendars and support their efforts. Uh, and actually, one of the founders of Switch Lanes, the president, is actually a former student of mine, um, and I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. These are local Belate natives that are really um, trying to step up efforts in programming and reaching um, people in our city. And then finally, um, August 21st, there is an eclipse, and I heard that Mark might be missing our meeting to get to that, so you can see, which I understand, it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I just, it might seem silly, but I want to just let residents know we should probably start doing some um, safety information to them that you really cannot stare at the eclipse. You, you could very possibly um, hurt your eyesight or go blind. And I don't know how we can do more to get the word out about the dangers of actually staring at the sun while the eclipse is happening. So um, just a little beginning to educate the public um, about that. You know, it's just something we're not used to dealing with because it only happens once in a lifetime. So um, again, don't stare at the eclipse. Please find um, some approved ways to look at what's happening with that beautiful eclipse. Thank you. Councilor Forbeck. Well, I just wanted to say that I couldn't go to the street dance myself, but I babysat two young grandchildren so my kids could go. Uh, and of course, living downtown, I heard the fun, so it's, it's great. Um, also, speaking of the eclipse, we have a whole group here. We just have to go down to the confluence, and they're going to help us see it and see it safely and everything. I, um, I think it's important, again, to say that this isn't just a place where kids come for nature. Um, we have taken the best practices from a place in Milwaukee called uh, the Urban Ecology Center, and they have fabulous data that shows that the kids who come and participate and volunteer really 
have significant improvement in um, their grades, their reading skills, their math, et cetera, et cetera. So again, while doing something wonderful for all of us, um, there's even deeper you know, meanings and uh, potential behind uh, that great uh, organization. So I wanted just to say those things. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Presho. Okay. Um, first, first of all, um, on, on August 19th, we have the Dirty Dash, the third annual Dirty Dash coming up. And as of this afternoon, there was at least 20 volunteers still needed to help out with that morning event. On, it's a Saturday morning. Um, I'd volunteer, but my, I'd leave my, my co-workers high and dry in the middle of farmer's market. That's not possible. So anyway, um, yeah, she de they definitely need help. Sonia Baden at the uh, pump house, contact her if you want to volunteer and help out. This is a really cool event and go out. Don't be afraid. You don't have to get dirty if you're just watching. Although, stand back, you may get splashed on. Anyway, it's a really cool event. Um, go check it out. Um, and a national night out, I, I managed to ride my bike around the west side. I missed some of the far west side block parties because uh, it was just too much area to cover and too many people to talk to. But I did hit seven block parties, and I saw the chief, I uh, saw Captain Reese. Um, had some great conversations, um, saw some of the fire department guys on, over on Garfield. And I took a, tried to kind of document it until it got so dark I couldn't. But um, it was a nice, a nice night. I got further this year than I did last year on my bike ride. So that was pretty cool. I just stuck to the west side because that was an easy circuit to make and still get dark. And when it gets dark, you got to know the road that you're riding on or you might hit something. Anyway, on a bicycle. Anyway, um, also, Sheila, I will not be here for your last meeting on the 21st unless there's no sunshine in Southern Illinois. So, um, and in Southern Illinois, during totality, you can look at the eclipse, which will be very cool. But, uh, and another reason I'm going. But um, there is another one in 2024, so hang on. <laughs> it's only seven years away. Almost the same path going the other way to the west, to the lower west, to the northeast. Anyway, um, anyway, so to get to, I want to say thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, for me personally, you've encouraged me. You've uh, you've certainly inspired me many times, and um, I really, really um, am thankful that you were here and that I got to know you and we got to do all those fun things, and um, like jump on you know suspension bridges and you know and play in the parks and and uh, and I really you you elevated my attention to what's going on in the city because of what you do and I just don't know what I'm going to do without you around here to uh, you know kind of get the flesh out the details and make us you know keep us on our toes and you know you are irrepressible and irreplaceable we're going to process to replace you but it won't be a replacement because you're not replaceable and you're, I'm surely going to miss you. You're going to, Blade's been really lucky to have you. Yeah. And I want to tell you that. Can I give you a hug? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting, this meeting is a call. <laughs> you want to hug? It's your birthday. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know. All right so. And that's it for me. So, Vice President Duncan, follow that. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll be, I'll be very brief tonight. First, I would like to thank um, our retirees for their service um, to the city of Beloit. They are um, Ben Smith, Al Melton, and Karen Thornson. They have put in a lot of hard work through the years. I wish each of them much luck with their future endeavors. Also, I had the chance to join the kickoff celebration at the National Night Out at Riverside Park and want to give special thanks to all our first responders. Some are here tonight. Um, our city staff and citizens that participated in that event, it was very, it was awesome. Also, I'm helping to raise funds for the State Line Family YMCA. And we'll be at Culver's Restaurant on Wednesday, August 9th from 4 to 8. So I encourage you, anyone that's listening or here tonight, to please join us. Um, and uh, also, I would, that's the end of my message tonight, but I would like to say happy birthday to our president, Kevin Levy. Thank you. Uh, I would like to just, uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, I think when we talk about showcasing Beloit, one event that gets a lot of people here um, is the street dance. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, each year, I think class reunions come there um, 
by the droves just to be part of that. They've now made they make it in, they have included it into their class reunion schedule. And in the comments you hear is this is not the same Beloit I knew when I left and when I graduated in '82. So I know they were here this past weekend and just hearing a lot of comments um, and people still hearing about street dance and wondering what it is and going down there and falling in love with it um, and going down there year after year. So I want to say hats off to Sean and her staff and all the volunteers in the city um, and anyone who has anything to do with that, the police, the fire, because if someone gets hurt, you guys are right there too. But this has become a huge event and it, it definitely showcased Beloit well. I guess Gets people back together. Um, so I just wanted to say hats off to uh, Shauna and her staff and everyone in Beloit because that's one of the, the big things that we have. Um, and then to the city manager, <clears throat> I know earlier in the year we discussed having a HR update in September. So hopefully that's still on schedule as we talked about. We want to look at the seasonal employment, uh, where are we at with that, what is the process of getting those positions. Um, then I want us to look overall and seeing what is our employment as it relates to our city, our population, our diversity. And then um, take it one step further, if we can seriously look at and discuss the recruitment processes for the Beloit um, Fire Department and the Police Department as well, um, because as we say, we have a lot of people retiring and what we want to do is make sure that um, all the departments are representative of our community. So I want to make sure that we touch on those uh, avenues as well. And I've had a conversation, so this is not really a surprise. I had a conversation with both chiefs about it before. Um, and there's um, individuals in the community, some organizations that's coming forward now and asking those questions. So I want to make sure that, as uh, Councilor DeForest said, we're not just talking about well, we need to do something, or we're going to do something, or we're planning on doing something. I think it's time now to see exactly what we have planned uh, to meet the needs of the city. And I'm not saying that we're not doing it, but we're getting a lot of questions now. Um, and I think we just need to start looking at the, the processes very closely and saying, what can we do? And I think for too long we've been saying, we're going to do something. We're going to do something. We're going to make plans. Well, now I think it's time to present those plans to us and say, here's what we're going to do, and here's what we've done. So we can get that. Um, is September, is that enough time? Would we be able to get it by September? Okay. Uh, and that's kind of all that I have as far as. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, item 10, city manager's presentation. I don't believe we don't, we don't, we don't. If none this evening. Uh, 11, report from boards and city officers. 11A, please. 11A is a resolution to approve a substantial amendment to the 2015-19 consolidated plan to incorporate two neighborhood revitalization strategy areas. Ms. Christensen, please. Um, so every five years, um, we approve, or the council approves, a consolidated plan. Your last consolidated plan was approved in November of 14 for the 2015-2019 time frame. Um, we are proposing to amend that plan to include two neighborhood revitalization strategy areas, which you heard about at your last meeting. Um, the CDBG regs put together a bunch of um, guidelines on how those can be put together. Um, you'll see in the document that was before you, there's a number of questions that HUD asks and makes us respond to, which are included as part of this plan amendment. Um, it basically deals with a variety of concerns in the community, specifically relating to deteriorated properties, vacant and abandoned housing, increasing number of rental properties, high rates of poverty and unemployment, and an increase in violent crimes. Um, the scope of the whole plan, it does examine the trends throughout the city, but does focus on the Hackett and Merrill neighborhoods. Um, our census track 16, block groups one through four, and census track 18, block groups one through four. Um, so we're proposing to designate both of those census tracts as NARSA areas. There are some benefits um, to um, doing NARSA areas. One is that the public services, which are carried out by HUD approved under a HUD approved NARSA, are not subject to the 15% public service cap when carried out by certain organizations. And then housing units assisted in an approved NARSA area, um, we're, we're able to provide some over income, or we are able to fund rehab in some higher income households um, than we are right now, which is right now it's got to be 100% 100% low mod. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words. Okay. Um, so you had your public hearing at the last meeting. You you saw the full presentation included in your packet is the NARSA. Um, 
and it's on your um, agenda for action tonight. And Terry Downing is here for if you have any questions for her. She is the one who put together 99% um, of the document. I did a percent. <laughs> Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Motion by Forbank. Is there a second? Second. Second by Anderson. Any counselor questions or comments? And I do, but I'm just trying to, and I think we've had this discussion mm -hmm. before um, about the homeless population. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to make sure that somewhere, whether it's in this plan, and I know we've got another consolidated plan that's in there, I just want to make sure we are seriously jumping on it. And I guess what really kind of drove it really home for me is probably about a month ago um, on a Friday when we had all the homeless people from a certain area being removed from that area. They didn't have any place to go. Um, I just want to make sure that we're confident that we have something in place to address the homeless population here in the city because I think it's going to get worse before it gets better and I don't want us to just I want to just make sure we got something in that place to to address it um, city manager oh I uh, if you were finished, sir. I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to reiterate what I believe we heard from uh, Julie at our past meeting and I uh, in fact pulled that document myself and looking at our um, five-year consolidated plan and viewing homelessness in particular as a, an issue that has no borders or boundaries um, the plan that is in effect for the entire city of Beloit um, does have a fair amount of detail in regard to how uh, we address and partner with other agencies to address homeless issues this particular amendment to that plan is adding a layer of detail uh, about what we're recommending for two specific neighborhoods at the request of the individuals who live in those neighborhoods. But I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that this is part of a, a larger plan that is in effect for the city at large. So um, I completely respect and understand your concern. I think that um, it, it's absolutely essential that we continue to keep that at top of mind uh, and make sure that any uh, partners that we're working with um, you know, understand that that is still a priority within that larger plan. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it may not be necessary to add to uh, this particular um, layer within the NARSA um, because it is focused really geographically uh, within those particular census tracts. Yeah. And is that consistent with your understanding? Yes, and this was intended, the NARSA is intended to deal with specific issues, issues that are specific to this neighborhood. And the, these two neighborhoods did not indicate that there was a greater need related to homelessness. And there is a Rock County Homeless Intervention Task Force, did I say that right? Um, who work, who meet every month, who get together every month. Um, as Laurie said, homelessness doesn't have a, there's not really border, you know, you don't, you're not a homeless person in Beloit or in South Beloit. You're homeless um, in our community. And so they do meet monthly. We do fund homeless organizations with our CDBG funds, have for many years. Um, you know, hands of faith. I think we did House of Mercy last year for this year for the first time. You know, we fund a variety of different homeless organizations. Um, and so I don't think we've lost sight of it. Uh, as Mark Perry indicated at the last meeting, you know, there is a group that is specifically focused on it. You know, we fund Project 1649. Um, so I think we already are working on it. Okay. And so, so it is included <coughs> in our broader five year plan. Okay. So which this is a part of. Is there an individual, let's say I want to go out and clothe or feed, take food to the homeless individuals, and I, I think I may have asked this, but I don't know if I talked to the city clerk about this or not, but is there an individual that's in charge of the homeless population that I would have to go to to say, I want to go feed the homeless? Is, is there an individual, uh, because, and I'm just going to, because there is kind of out there, uh, in the land that I know individuals that want to go do this, but they're being told you got to talk to a certain individual before you do that. And if that's the case, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, that we have homeless individuals and people who really want to help. And I don't want to get too far off the track here, and we need to take this offline. We can, but I just heard that a lot, that, hey, I just want to go take them some food or some clothing, but I'm getting pushed back because I didn't talk to certain individuals. 
Is it okay for me to just jump in and talk? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so with the Homeless Intervention Task Force, they have uh, they get funding through the state, um, which is actually federal funding, and they have a system in place for single point of entry. So, if a, so, first I'll talk about the homeless individuals, and then I'll talk about how to help those people. Um, so, if so, if a homeless individual comes into one of the agencies that's part of the Homeless Intervention Task Force, and there's a number of agencies um, in that task force, they can get help at any agency. So that person, the agency that, that they make contact with, will network with the other agencies in the Homeless Intervention Task Force to make sure that their needs are being met. Housing, clothes, food, if it's crisis, if it's not crisis, that kind of thing. Rental assistance and all of those, those kind of things. Um, so as far as the, the system for when somebody would like to have some assistance, that system isn't perfect, but it's getting better. Okay. The state is requiring this single point of entry. So, uh, so people aren't showing up at an agency saying, I'm homeless, what do I do? And an agency isn't going, oh, I don't do that. Um, you're going to have to, I don't know what to tell you. So they're, they are creating, they're making sure that there's a network. If somebody would like to help individuals in crisis or who want to do um, assistance with the homeless, I would suggest that they come to the Homeless Intervention Task Force meetings. They're once a month at ECHO in Janesville. Okay. And um, we have somebody in our department, Ashley Rosenbaum, who is who attends those meetings. And, and it's open to anyone. So any, any volunteers, any agency. Hmm? Um, I'm not sure what the time is because they've changed it oh, since okay. I've since I've gone. But um, so we do have somebody. We were disconnected for a little while, but now that we have a compliance specialist, she can go to those meetings <laughs> to make sure that we still have our pulse on what's happening with okay. the homeless intervention task force. So that would be a perfect place to start because the agencies always need volunteers. They always need people helping with food, shelter, uh, clothing, things like that. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. It did. Okay. Thank you. Is so much better than <laughs> and I believe we have a motion and a second for approval for item 11A. Um, all those in favor of approval say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, it passes 11B, please. I'll just, for the record, it passed 5 0 with two counselors recusing yeah. themselves. Yeah. 11B is a resolution to approve a substantial amendment to the 2017 annual action plan to reprogram unspent CDBG funds. Ms. Christensen. Um, so we have a number of dollars, about 358000 in unspent prior year CDBG funds. Um, and what we're proposing to do is to take those unspent funds and to reprogram them to allow us to jump into the NARSA right away. So we, um, we want to be able to, we don't want to have to wait till we get 18 money, whenever that happens. Um, this will, will allow us to kind of jump in and start working on the NARSA right away. Um, so what we're proposing to fund is Community Actions Resource Navigator. Um, and so that basically would be a position that would help someone navigate through the resources and figure out, you know, if somebody comes in with one issue, they kind of help identify all the resources that are out there for them because that been, has been identified as a big gap that people don't know where to go for resources. Um, and then funding Family Services Community Social Worker, um, and that will... We're, that person will work with police and fire, but basically to deal with mental health issues um, that come up in our community or in these two neighborhoods. Neighbor works down payment assistance um, to provide some additional money for people to buy houses in these two neighborhoods so that we can increase home ownership that way. Um, some increased money for the housing rehab loan program. We've already begun, begun doing some targeted um, to homeowners. Um, of that program in those two neighborhoods, and then additional funds for um, code enforcement. Um, the first three programs, the Research Navigator, Community Social Worker, and Down Payment Assistance are public service programs, but will be exempt from the public service cap because they will be carried out by a qualifying organization under the NARSA plan. Um, and then this is on your agenda for action tonight. Okay. Item 11B is on for action tonight. Is there a motion for approval? Yes, motion by four back. Is there a second? Second, second by Blakely. Uh, question. So the, the leftover funds that you have, they can only be used for the, these purposes, nothing else, right? This is what you're approving. If you approve it tonight, that's what you're approving. You're approving to take it, the money from number two and put it into number three. Okay. Okay. And then we will... Um, work on contracts with them and putting all the documents together to get them funding, hopefully yet this year to begin 
um, to hit the ground. The resources navigator is on board already, okay. but to continue to, um, because we kind of wanted to bring this plan to you earlier this year, and be, so we want to kind of get try to get something done yet this year. Okay, I just want to make sure for the public that may be watching, say we have unspent money, why can't we use that in another area of the city's budget or they, funding? Something? There was a public hearing at your last meeting where we presented this, and they had okay. an opportunity to get up and speak. Okay. Has there been a motion and a second? All those in favor of approval say aye. Oh, All the questions, Mark. I just had a question. Go ahead. Um, the uh, three fifty four, the three hundred fifty four thousand, somehow uh, for economic development. That's just economic development funds that we're repurposing. It is some loan funds um, that were unspent. Um, it is um, some of the downtown programs that have. Um, money from 13 and 14 and we have a requirement that money has to be spent mm -hmm. um, within a short time period sure and so some money was I was trying to think if it was in here but it's not um, some money was um, Shauna did was able to give out some of the money but some of the money did not get spent at all and so we're, we're reprogramming <coughs> the funds at this point okay so, so it's, a combination, it's a combination of programs so. we're not going to impact any existing uh, plans or uses or whatever programs may be yeah, involved are, with those funds. These are programs that the money just wasn't being used okay. and HUD has a specific time frame in which you have to spend money and if we don't program it to things that will spend it, we're going to lose it. Yeah, I just want to make sure that was yeah, clear. And we've waited too long already. We're so not we taking anything away from anything. So thank you. Okay. Motion and a second. All those in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Passes 5-0 with two abstaining. Correct. Correct. All right. Thank you. Item 11C, please. Can we hold on to the other two yep. come in? So. Wait till our, those are recused. Shana, come forward. <coughs> 11C. 11C is a resolution authorizing the city manager to apply for Hendricks Family Foundation's grant. Ms. Adela Mee. Thank you, and thanks for the kudos on street dance. It really takes a village to do all of that. We have over 60 volunteers that work that night, um, and my board chair, Peter Frank, is here, and he was in charge of the beer tent all night, so that was great. <laughs> so, he did awesome. <laughs> Um, so we, um, before you today, um, we would like to apply on behalf of the Downtown Boyd Association uh, for the Hendricks Family Foundation grant. Um, that grant is actually used for multiple things. Um, they really don't have a threshold on dollars. Um, if you remember in the news, not that long ago, the Blender Cafe was given some startup money. Uh, Turtle Creek Bookstore was given money for a book drive. Um, Hendricks Family Foundation obviously gave to the YMCA and the um, Heart Hospital. Those are larger projects. So they give a mixture of dollar amounts depending on what the project is. So I just want to clarify that first um, just because of the amount of money that we're asking for. Um, so if you can remember, our um, organization next year is going to be 30 years old. So we're very excited about that. And in order to celebrate 30 years, we want to think big and do something big. Uh, so what we want to apply for with the money would uh, number one be self-watering hanging baskets and if any of you have been downtown in the last couple days uh, you would see that because the drought and because the heat the hanging baskets are not doing so well so with this uh, what it would do is actually you only have to fill the container within the hanging basket once every three days um, it holds a gallon and a half of water so it waters them as they need it it doesn't overwater, but it doesn't underwater um, so the roots are always able to uh, keep growing uh, the other part is uh, during Farmer's Market, uh, we just got our preliminary numbers for Farmer's Market, and I'll tell you because you'll keep it a secret, right? Um, so our new numbers are over 9,200 people every single Saturday. So just to let you know. <laughs> Now, um, how much that has grown, I started this position in 2012, and we counted, and there was an average of 3,000 people. So in five years, we have tripled the number of people coming to the market, which is amazing uh, for our community, for our downtown, for our vendors that are there. Um, but really, it's the quality of life that we want to bring. Uh, and with that, we need public restrooms. So one of the only complaints we ever get about Farmer's Market is, where can I use the restroom? Um, so we would like to build 
build a structure similar to this, um, but it would actually be L-shaped, um, large. This was an internet copy, so no copyright here. But we would actually have a structure built that would be back in the parking lot of the Mill Street lot, near the dumpster enclosure area behind Bushel and Pack, Beggles and more, if you kind of know where that's at. Um, so not in the gantry, off the gantry area. It would also drive more people, the people traffic, to that parking lot because there are vendors in that parking lot. So it's really just going right outside the boundaries. It's not really a long walk. If you're thinking about standing on the corner of State and Grand, you may think that's a longer distance, but people are going over there anyways for those vendors. Um, and then the other thing, um, this is a rendition that Angus Young did for us we want to build a structure over the parking lot of the gantry uh, and the reason for that is because a few years ago uh, we had a very tragic street dance that got rained out and that is not good for our organization because we actually are only funded by our bid 30 percent 70 percent comes from having different events like that and also the sponsorships that we get for those events so we lost out on a lot of money that year um, and it's very detrimental to our organization so what that would do is uh, you can see where the stage is you can see where Bushel and Peck is on the left and the fat wallet building um, that's currently vacant on the right and that structure would be a uh, clear material that you can see through the sun would still come you'd still get all of that but it would be covered and then we'd also like to do other event extras. So um, there is research that shows that if you can um, stay longer at an event, you're obviously going to spend more money um, at our businesses and everything. And one big issue right now is people always say we need a charging station for our cell phones um, because those are the end all be all of life. Let's just be real. So if your cell phone is about to die, you have to go home. So this is just one way of doing that um, by having a charging station um, at our booth um, that we would control and we would um, manage and take care of. Um, we also have a stage. Um, that stage, you saw at Street Dance, but that stage goes all over Rat County and a little bit further. Um, and it actually goes to anybody who wants to rent it. We um, rent it out on a very regular basis all summer long. Um, it's going to be at the South Bullet Corn Boil in a couple weeks that I'm sure some of you will probably attend. Um, so what we want to do is wrap that stage. That would be advertising for Beloit. That when that event goes to Durand or it goes to South Beloit, those people People are reminded to come to Beloit and see all the changes that have happened in Beloit and maybe they're one of the reunion people that hasn't been here in 15 20 years and we want to let them know what all we have to offer to bring them here um, so that would just help to advertise Beloit in all, as a whole and then the other part that we want to do is holiday decorations throughout downtown um, the decorations that we have right now um, are <laughs> Andrew can probably attest to how old are they? That's the new trivia question. Um, so they're very old. We have to re do the bulbs every single year we have what we call a lighting party where you go unscrew all the bulbs and screw in new ones it's very fun and entertaining um so we want to do led with everything and actually i have about 20 different uh, ideas that our design committee has come up with uh, large and small so ones that would hang like this that you see in the example but also ones that would be large that would sit on like gantry stage um, so big led structures that could really highlight the downtown and encourage more of that ambiance that we really love during the holiday season. So um, there is no um, cap like I mentioned but what we would like to apply for is $500,000 um, to get all of these things that I mentioned done. The largest of those would obviously be the gantry structure um, would be half of that requested amount. It is quite expensive to build that. Um, but we would also like to really all next year highlight the fact that we're 30 years old. We've done amazing things in 30 years. And what can we really do for the next 30 and beyond? Um, there is no impact to budget because there is no matching required with this grant. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. It doesn't affect the city's budget and it doesn't affect our budget. And I would entertain any questions. Uh. <laughs> Council DeForest. Thank you. I'm very excited about a lot of the elements that you have proposed. A couple questions. Um, will the proposed 
bathroom structure, how many parking spots will it displace? We will um, actually take out three parking stalls, okay. um, and that really is also because behind the structure, we're actually going to implement a little bit of storage uh, for the stuff that we have to bring to the market every Saturday. Okay. Uh, we bring a van load of stuff every week, um, so we're hoping to put a lot of that into that as well. Um, so we did plan it out to where there would be um, four regular stalls, unisex stalls, and two handicap accessible stalls, um, so a total of six. Uh, we're thinking will fit <laughs> so um, we obviously haven't applied for anything with the city or the plan commission or anything like that so um, once we get to that stage we'll do that and hopefully I mean if we could fit more we would great and then the stage wrap so hopefully that will be a truly beautiful marketing piece you'll have a beautiful landscape view of downtown Beloit or the riverfront or something on that wrap to because I don't want to just have the logo on it I want it to yeah. <laughs> really advertise what Beloit has to offer so yeah and we're incorporating um, so if any of you have seen the visit Beloit cruiser um, they have pictures um, we actually um, are proposing that we have pictures but we also have words so that way it's really highlighting what Beloit is and what not just the downtown what boy as a whole is and it get people to understand boy is a great place to live work and play and, and let's go there so um, it'll definitely be our design committee doing all that um, but definitely um, we'll be showcasing all of boy but it, you know pictures and words because we need both of those not just a logo no great great thank you <laughs> councilor duncan I just want to say thank you, Shauna, to you and the Downtown Beloit Association and your whole group because I realize how many vendors you have down there. I just couldn't believe it. I believe it's over like 75, but I was over so... Over 90. How many? 95? 95. Wow. And that's why I said, it's, it's really something to see. So if members of the public, if you haven't seen it, you've got to go down there. I was really impressed. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Good job. Well done. Councilor Blakely. Yes, I want to echo Regina's thank you to you and the members of your team at the Downtown Beloit Association. You do fabulous work. And it wasn't long ago that I was down at, at one of the downtown restaurants and they said, better get your order in now. The tourists are about to descend on us, which is a wonderful thing to hear <laughs> in, our, in our lovely city. And as you probably know, there was a recent article in the New York Times featuring Beloit mm -hmm. that mentioned the Hendricks family's um, continuing contributions and our revitalization. And it paid special attention to the downtown and what remarkable changes have been wrought there. So thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions uh, that I have when you... If you were to receive this grant, is there a way that you can create some signage or information about parking? Um, because people for the 82 reunion, they were kind of calling me or seeing me saying, if I go down there, where do I park? Okay, the parking. So I was kind of directing them to different places. And I think, um, I don't know if you have that already for farmer's market, but just maybe details are saying, hey, here, you can go park here for free. You can go park in different areas for free. Because I think when people are coming back here, they just know downtown and they they don't realize you can't get down the street until they get there so yeah with the parking study that was just completed that was a lot of the suggestions that they provided and we do have to um, get all that on to the traffic review committee um, to get implemented and I'm working with Jason Dupuy on that um, and then I also reached out to a lot of the property owners already who have larger lots um, First National Bank is a great partner of ours and they let us use their employee lot and their bank lot every week for farmers market um, so we're working on a way that we could have signage put in place that could say Monday through Friday 8 to 5 it's first national all other times is public parking um, and we've worked with a couple of the smaller property owners already who have said you know get whatever signage you want and put it out there I'm happy and even if it's portable signage give it to them and they'll put it out every Saturday so um, and during street dance as well so yeah we're working on that right now I know the process takes a while um, to get it on traffic review so I'm just waiting for Jason Dupuy to, to get that on there okay um, the other question that I have is as we you, you taught you mentioned that you lost a lot of money one year because it rained is there a way? I know it's street dance, and I know we want to be outside, but have you planned uh, in the event that it rains again? Is there a venue around town that you can say it won't be street dance? We may be inside, but it's 
the, the concept will be the same so you won't lose that funding. Unfortunately, we looked at that even up to that same week that that was happening. We were, it, there was rain in the forecast and all that. Unfortunately, there's no large venues um, unless we go to the Eclipse Center, and the Eclipse Center is very expensive. Um, so that would actually put us in the negative more than it would the positive to do that there and to book it you would have to reserve it well in advance and pay a deposit and um, so unfortunately you know we did look at other options but the downtown locations that we have the max that would fit would be 300 and while that would be great it's not the 3,000 that we really like to have at street dance okay Okay. And I believe this structure would allow for that um, because you could have the band still in our um, stage that we have off behind that structure, and then all the people could be underneath the structure. So it would still fit at least a thousand. So that, that would be 3,000 people in a confined. Yeah, but at least a thousand. Like, think Oktoberfest type of people would still fit under that structure. Okay. Council DeForest. Thank, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to ask about the, the gantry uh, structure. What kind of material are you proposing? I want to make sure we're not stuck with maintenance down the road. I mean, it's great if we have it gifted, but then you'll, your organization will have to pay for maintenance. So what are you looking at? We were looking at exactly the same materials that are used for the gantry right now, and they have a huge long-time warranty on that. So the pillars would be the same bricks. Um, the metal would be the same metal materials. Um, and Angus Young helped us design that with that in mind to where there would not be recurring costs for us. Um, um, we believe that, you know, even if it was something like we have to pay somebody to get up there and pressure wash because it is a clearer um, material, then, you know, that cost would probably not be as much as losing out on street dance. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I don't believe we have a motion. Is there a motion? Um, awesome. Motion by pressure. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. <laughs> second by four, second by four back. <laughs> uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Passes. Thank you. Item 11D, please. 11D is a resolution approving an IGA between the County of Rock, City of Beloit, City of Janesville, Town of Beloit, Town of Milton, and Village of Clinton related to the 2017 Seat Belt Enforcement Task Force grant. Chief Z. Good evening, counselors. Um, <clears throat> this is the last in the trilogy of Bureau of Traffic Safety grants that we're eligible for. <laughs> as with the other ones, um, so this one is. As long as the trilogy. <laughs> is trilogy, yeah. <laughs> this one's being administered by the Rock County Sheriff's Office. We're eligible for fifteen thousand with a thirty-eight hundred dollar match. Um, we've been involved with this for the last ten years. It is an ongoing grant opportunity, and your approval of the resolution would allow us to enter into the intergovernmental agreement to effectuate the grant with our other law enforcement partners. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Motion by DeForest. Is there a second? Second. Second by Blakely. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7-0. Thank you. 11E, can I get a motion to adjourn into closed so session? Moved. Motion by Presho. Second. second by Duncan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we are in a closed session and we may <laughs> Um, appear back for action. for action. Thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to go back into open session? Motion by DeForest, second by Duncan. All those in favor say aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, we're back in open session. Did I make that up? <laughs> okay. All right. Would you like me to read the resolution? Sure. We're looking for uh, a motion to approve a resolution approving settlement agreement and authorizing execution thereof regarding Menard Inc. property tax assessment litigation. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, motion by press was a second by Duncan. All those in favor? Uh, questions or comments? Do you want me just to do a brief on the record um, result of the settlement agreement? Sure. Since we're, yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> the, well, we're also on camera, are we not? Or TV? Yes, okay. we are. Um, the city has been involved in litigation with Menards uh, for 2016 and 2017. Um, the assessed value for the property at 2851 Milwaukee Road um, was assessed at $9.5 million by the tax assessor in 2016 and 2017. Uh, Menard uh, valued the property much lower in the $6 million range. 
the city has been negotiating with Menards and has received um, a proposed settlement of $8.7 million for 2016 and $8.5 million for 2017. Uh, we think that that is in the best interest of the city to resolve both years' worth of litigation and ask that you approve a resolution with those amounts for the settlement. Okay. So there is a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, passes 7-0. Motion to adjourn. So Motion by Anderson. Second, uh, is there a second? Second by DeForest. All those in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned.